Beyond Belief. This is episode 144. I'm your co-host, Mindy Erkin, and with me today is your host, Paul Marco. Hey, well, welcome to another episode of World Beyond Belief. We're happy to have you here. Uh, You're going to be sharing um, a wild adventure. Not only do we have uh, an exciting and possibly strange topic, depending on your orientation, but we also have a new computer, which could be adventurous. And we're trying Camtasia, as you know, because you can see us now. You're going to be able to see us when we're not showing you things. We're going to try to do the Camtasia thing. So that should be adventurous. Also, we're going to take another look at Jade Helm type issues. The reason we're going to do this is because we were sitting around the other night and we were going over some of the facts about Jade Helm and they really didn't make sense based on what we know about Jade Helm. Uh, Then we ran into some other information that we're going to share with you. Also, I want to use this this episode to emphasize going into the fringe and also using a little bit of reasoning. I think that when you're, I always like to focus on the processes that we go through in our awakening. Naturally, we want to share things with other people. But one of the things that helps us awaken is if we're not afraid to go into the fringe, you know, go into things There's consensual reality, and then there's the margins. And the way it works is they keep us confined in what's believable in consensual reality. And sometimes some fringe subjects can leak in and out, like veganism, sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's not. But the fringe subjects, that's where you're going to learn what's really going on. That's where you're going to learn the things that they want to keep from you. And that's where consciousness expansion is going to happen. So it's important that we get into the fringe. Now, we don't want to believe everything there. We want to pick things up, look at it, try it on, use it, wear it as temporary, temporary useful perceptions, discard it if it doesn't seem to fit with everything else, but keep it in the back so in case we get some new information, we can pull it in. You don't want to be caught saying, ah, That just couldn't be true. How could that? That's way outside. Because what you're doing is you're living in the consensual reality that they gave you. And that's what keeps us trapped. That's what keeps us in the matrix. So I want to encourage fringy, fringing. Let's call it fringing. I want to encourage fringing today. And also using reason to take apart and deconstruct some of the things that they've given us as truths. So this could be a little bit of a mind warping kind of uh, episode. It could um, really be exciting if you can uh, make your ego sit back and just take it in and not feel threatened by this information. And it could be a real adventure in Uh, the expansion of consciousness. So that's what we're going to try to do, and we're going to try to do well in Camtasia with our new computer. So it should be a a thoroughly um, adventurous couple hours for for all of us, uh, Mindy and I included. Well, as I said, we were going through the other day, and we were reviewing some of the things that um, we were told about Jade Helm that just didn't seem to resonate with us. I mean, if all the other solutions that people are suggesting, like they're going to disarm uh, the people, it's a financial collapse, uh, on and on and on, they seem really mundane. And the things that they're preparing for that, it's, it's like inappropriate. They wouldn't be doing these things. They wouldn't be getting these things. That's what we came to as we were going through these things. So let's go through a few of the items so you can see our logic. And you probably will be able to find even more things as you get into this line of thinking. Well, the first thing we were wondering about was the equipment. 
the military equipment. Now, I, I really didn't get very far in my military career. The, the highest I ever got was Cub Scouts, and I wasn't really, I knew that I wasn't, you know, a military kind of guy. So I wondered why no one is analyzing the type of equipment they're using in terms of what type of a maneuver they're going to do. I mean, it seems to me if they're going to pick people up, they'd be having big vans and buses and things like that. They wouldn't be having uh, MRAPs. Also, it seemed like there were a lot of tanks going in. What, what, what are they going to fight? I, I mean, uh, this is what they're going to put up against the militias? I, I really don't think so. I think they'll, what they'll use against the militias is a sonic weapon. They'll blast them out with some type of a sonic ray, and then they'll walk in and pick up their guns. That'll be the end of that. So I don't know what, you know, it just, it just amazes me. I, I'd really like to get somebody that really was an experienced military guy to uh, go through and look at the, the different pictures and say, well, you know, they use this for this and that for that. Or, or is it just a one-size-fits-all thing? I'm, I'm really not sure. But it seems to me that the drill, especially if it's a drill, why would you move all that equipment to the, uh, to the Middle States or the West Coast? Uh, you know, the speculation is, is there going to be an asteroid hit the, hit the East Coast? Are they going to fake something like that? Who knows? Maybe that's why they're getting the equipment out of danger. But I've heard that there's equipment moved like this all over the world. So it's not just, it's not just about that. There's different places in the world where there's, they're putting a lot of equipment. And I, I personally don't buy the Russia against China, against ISIS and all that stuff, because I know that's all puppeted by the same people. So it seems to me that it doesn't make sense moving all that equipment, that type of equipment, that way. And I, I really would appreciate somebody who's really got a deep military background. I was thinking of calling Jim Fetzer because he would know. But uh, I didn't. So <laughs> we're going to go on to the next thing. The next thing is, supposedly, they have boxcars with shackles in them. Now, suppose, well, this is a picture of a uh, of a guillotine, which they supposedly have, they have guillotines too. But the shackles in boxcars. Now, it seems to me that when you're, when you're hauling something by freight, you want to haul it great distances. And I think there's 200 and some FEMA camps now. So it seems to me that if you were hauling people to the FEMA camps, you might use another type of uh, transportation, maybe school buses or something. Yeah, this this might be the shackled box cars. It looks like. So here they are. Some somebody saw those. Seems to me that if you're gonna put, some, oh, these are box cars, but they're on trucks. Well, anyway, if you were using a railroad, it seems to me you're taking people great distances. Maybe that's my idea. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But it just seems to me if you're going to shackle people and take them great distances, you might use a car like that. But for hauling them from where they are, I mean, Chicago to the nearest FEMA camps, probably 50 miles. Who knows? But uh, so that didn't make sense. No, it didn't. <clears throat> All right. So then I looked at the helicopters. Now, you know that the helicopters have been taken away from the Texas National Guard. We're going to try to find a military. There we go. There's helicopters. For some reason, they don't want the Texas governor and his uh, National Guard to be watching what they're doing, or at least getting an aerial view of what's going on during Jade Helm. Um, this is really blacking, blacking it out from even the local government. So that's, that's of course, what they would do if they were going to confiscate guns or, um, you know, remove a section of the population that they thought might be troublesome. But it just seems to me, it strikes me as odd 
that if it's a maneuver and they're doing that, that they wouldn't want anyone to see it from above. That just, it didn't make sense. I think there's going to be, it seems to me that there are things that they don't want you to see that are going to be stranger than strange. And so they don't want the eye in the sky from the governor of Texas. So that didn't make sense for me. <clears throat> and then, this is total craziness, is the closing of Walmarts. Now, they're, they've also they've closed Target stores, all the, these big stuff, box stores, Target stores in Canada, and laid off, I heard, 70,000 people. Now, you know, I've, I've been associated with re retail firms, and I know that retailers work on a really slim profit margin. Now, maybe, maybe uh, Sam Walton doesn't with Walmart because he, you know, he screws the Chinese manufacturers and then he screws the people here, uh, the, the employees. So maybe he's been able to make it a highly profitable, really fat cat kind of business. But for all the uh, retail firms I was either employed by or consulted with, they have, they have a real small profit margin. So if you, you lose uh, one day's revenue, uh, that could cause you to not make your numbers that month. And if you don't make your numbers that month, well, the store manager doesn't get the bonus. The division manager doesn't get a bonus. The vice president doesn't get a bonus. And I don't know, it used to, heads used to roll because of that. But now they're shutting down on more or less permanent basis, these retail chains. When I was in retail, it took a year for a store to actually be profitable, to get uh, people to come there, to get the advertising to work right, to get people conditioned. But they're just closing the stores down. It doesn't make sense. Now, you know, of course, they're connected with FEMA. And they've been in on meetings with FEMA and supposedly they're connected with these underground tunnels that crisscross the United States and it actually all over the world. Um, so it seems like there's something much darker than just closing a retail store. Um, this doesn't make sense and it certainly doesn't make sense with any of the objectives that they've stated uh, that 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 might be going on with, with Jade Helm. The one, you know, I've worked with uh, mainstream media and the government long enough to know that if they're saying something, you can almost guarantee, almost guarantee that it's either misleading or false. There's going to be shreds of truth in there, but not much. So that didn't make sense with me. And then, of course, there's the coffins. These FEMA coffins. Um, here we go back to FEMA <laughs> coffins. And I've got a real interesting, introducing the Hercules, a polymer vault engineered to a higher standard, utilizing nature's captured air principle for double protection. Now, now if these are coffins, uh, you know, these will be dead people put into these little uh, plastic Tupperware type containers. Engineered for convenient storage with nesting and stacking capability, incredibly easy to attach to the, the dome to the base. I guess the dome is the lid. Engineered to be non-biodegradable. Engineered with 180 degree reinforced channeled edge. Uh, 90 degree corners, high density water resistant propylene, engineered with 64 cross rib structured supports. This uh, drawing is uh, available on the internet. We just picked it up. We just Googled it and it came in. Now, when they did mass executions, or when they've always done mass executions, uh, the the cabal that seems to be doing wanting to do them now, if they're going to take it to the FEMA camps and execute you uh, with those with those guillotines, now why you would use a guillotine to execute someone 
it's a guillotine to me is a theatrical device. It's all about scaring you, unless, of course, there's a real uh, need to separate the head from the body. If that's a if that's part of the criteria for um, the the body ending up. But let's go back to the let's go back to these coffins here. This is a lot of fun, this thing. <laughs> How about let's get let's get this one where the guy's sitting in there. We're gonna we're gonna get this right. Here we go. And there he is, and apparently this will hold three or four bodies depending on how big they are. Now, when they've killed people before, like Pol Pot or or supposedly Hitler or any of the other mass murderers, they didn't buy uh, Tupperware containers for them. What they did was they made them dig their grave or they'd bulldoze the graves in and then they'd bulldoze the bodies into the graves and then cover them up. It was a real simple process. I guess if they thought it was leaking into the groundwater, they'd sprinkle it with lime or something. Or what they could do is they could sprinkle gasoline on it. That would, that would feed the uh, petroleum industry and then uh, throw a match on them and then cover them over. But why do you think they want to package, they want to package the bodies, hopefully dead bodies, in a little Tupperware container? It just doesn't make sense to me. It's, it just seems, uh, seems bizarre, irrelevant, and it seems like they're, it seems like these are for a different purpose. And uh, we might have, try to brainstorm what that purpose might be later on in the episode, but let's get on to the other one. The next one that we thought about was hollow point bullets. Can we find our hollow points? Here they are. Now, these little beauties are totally useless. They, uh, they're outlawed in war. They're not good for target practice because, you know, you'll take down the whole target. Yeah, that might be a good picture. Oh my God. Look at this hollow point conventional. So what they had us all thinking when, when these 1.6 billion bullets were purchased was that, oh my God, it's going to be the zombie apocalypse. Remember that? That the Ebola virus or the vaccine for the Ebola virus was going to turn us all into zombies and... Uh, they were going to have to shoot us with hollow point bullets. Now, I I don't know. I what's the it, it, I don't know. How do you kill a zombie? Do you have to? Uh, a zombie isn't the one where you drive a stake through their heart or shoot them with a sil maybe a silver bullet. I think in some of the zombie movies you have to sell, cut their heads off. But I've never heard a mention of a hollow point bullet that blows the thing apart. If I was going to hunt something large, I mean big, like 10, 15, 20 feet tall, I'd want one of these. I mean, I'd want something that really could do some damage. If I was going to hunt an elephant and I didn't want to have a trophy or, or eat it or if I wanted to just ruin the whole elephant, I'd, I'd probably use a hollow point bullet, but. Hollow point bullets don't make sense. And uh, it's part of our lead up to Jade Helm buying 1.6 billion hollow point bullets and distributing throughout the, throughout the uh, government, like giving them to the Social Security Administration. You know, this is a thing that, this is a Roosevelt administration um, kind of a thing to help people um, in their old age or when if they became disabled and now they need hollow point bullets. Uh, Department of Agriculture, we all need hollow point bullets. But anyway, those things didn't make sense either. And then something else came to our attention. It is called remote um, neural monitoring. I think that's what it's called. Remote neural monitoring. This is where, this is uh, technology. 
that is now in the hands of the cabal, where they can um, monitor your thoughts and emotions and then download them and then codify them, put them in the number base, and then feed it back to you anytime they want you to experience those thoughts or those emotions. So what they can do, and in addition to, of course, giving you cancer or heart attacks anytime they want to do that, they can make you think something, feel something, and do something. So one at a time, what they can do, they can make, they could make, I don't know, 25 gun owners get up in the morning and go out and shoot one another. And here's another good piece of the puzzle. Google is working on um, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a very dangerous thing to work on. But Google is working on the artificial intelligence. So this codification reality for an individual can be put into a cloud and it can work on an entire group of people. So in addition to manipulating you with TV, which they do all the time, they've done it for a long time, they just manipulate the shit out of you with TV, uh, they're going to be able to do it when you don't even have a TV. They're going to do it through your smart devices. They're going to do it through your smart watch, your smart phone, or, you know, just a neighbor's smart refrigerator. <laughs> They've got you. And in, in a sh very short period of time, they're going to have you marching to whatever beat they want to have. Now, if you think about that in terms of Jade Helm and what we're doing with Jade Helm, why would they be going to all the trouble of moving all the military equipment and making all the hubbub? I mean, it could be fear invoking. And they, they do like to keep you in fear because when you're in fear, you're part of the distortion. When you're in love, you're part of the natural environment. And they want to keep you in the distortion because they are the distortion. So they're a year, maybe two away from being able to control you totally like this. Why are they going to the, to the trouble of Jade Helm except for the fear factor? Because they've really, unless we all wake up and we wake up fast, they, they have us by the short hairs. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about it with that kind of technology. Moving on, let's look at the economic collapse scenario, which I think might be true. But it seems to me if I wanted to worry about um, what, what are you going to do with the, the, the military stuff? You're going to protect the infrastructure. If I wanted to protect the infrastructure during an economic collapse, I'd move military equipment to New York, San Francisco, Chicago. I'd move it to, to deep population centers where there's a lot of people and they could do a lot of damage. I wouldn't move it to West Texas. I wouldn't move it to New Mexico. I mean, it, I, I really think that uh, something's going to happen economically. They're going to do something there. But I don't think the military and the equipment are for that. Because I think what they'd like to do during the economic collapse is sit back and watch things unfold on their uh, the monitor. The, the TV monitors that they have on every building. They even have them in, uh, in cactus in, in, I think it's Arizona. They call them cacti's. So the cacti's, <laughs> they'll be watching you rip one another apart trying to get a loaf of bread through the cacti's. I don't think they're, you know, I don't think, I don't think that's, that's what Jade Helm's about. I think that's going to happen, but I don't think that's what Jade Helm's about. Also, there's a lot of technology now where they can remove your entire soul from your body. They can codify it and move it out and move a, another entity in. So when you have that kind of technology, uh, boots on the ground, 
um, just seemed to me to be irrelevant. So, so the more we thought about it, the more we thought, well, you know, there's got to be more. There's got to be so much stuff that we don't know about what's going on uh, that we really need to take another, another maybe deeper look at what's going on. And then we reflected back on, well, maybe, maybe what's happening right? because we follow Alfred Lamermont Weber, and he seems to think that there's a what he calls a fleet out there battling with uh, the control matrix on the Earth and the, uh, what do we call it, the breakaway civilization technology, and they seem to be winning, that maybe this is an effort to protect uh, themselves from, from this. I don't know whether that makes sense or not. I don't even know whether that's happening. But we do have confirmation from people who have uh, Generation 3 and 4 night vision goggles that there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the skies every night. Uh, it's probably going on in the skies every day, but you can't see it. Uh, so, so we're sitting there and we're thinking, boy, Jade Helm is much deeper and darker and more mysterious than anything we've, we've put in our podcast, podcast before. And then, and then we came across this video. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is May the 5th, 2015. Uh, I'm Cindy K. Kerr here, and it is uh, almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon here uh, at Lake Norman in North Carolina. And uh, this is my second video of the day. I want to bring you some stuff. Um, you know, if you've, if you've watched my other videos, you've seen that we have... Uh, pieced together a stream of evidence showing that researchers believe that the Dolce base is, is there and that there's a strong indication that it's still active. Documents that I've seen recently indicate that the closer researchers have gotten to the entities that are down there, the deeper they go. Um, and so that could be an explanation for why we haven't found them yet. There are maps uh, circulating that show several underground, deep underground bases around the United States. Um, if you check out my videos, you'll see some of them. There are also maps circulating that show uh, tunnels that connect those bases. You will also see how um, Walmarts connect to some of the bases and some of the tunnels. And as we go on, you will, we will begin to, in fact, we've already begun to hear about more big box store closings um, because we've received information about Lowe's, uh, Home Depot, and others that are uh, connected. Um, to the Department of Homeland Security, potentially NASA, and other government agencies. And so, you know, I, I feel we've done a, a pretty good job substantiating uh, some of the things that have been said. So we won't belabor that part anymore. What we want to get to is educating ourselves on what may be down there and what we can do about it. And so I thought I would uh, bring to you some documents. And I will put a link to where you can download this PT PDF. This is called the Pulsar Project. And I believe this was completed around 1990 or so. Uh, it was an investigation um, carried out in... Uh, into alien life forms. And the writer of this report, of these notes, is not listed here. Um, but the introduction to the report, you know, says that uh, this document may disturb you. And so I will say the same thing. What we're going to talk about today, um, you actually may find disturbing. 
So what I want to say is, um, if you are vulnerable right now, if you're going through some kind of loss or some kind of uh, acute traumatic stress, or if you've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, or if you just feel vulnerable right now, go ahead and put this video aside for later. If you're of a strong constitution and feel ready to dig in, I would encourage you to gather with uh, a few of your friends to watch these. These videos that I'm doing now may challenge your worldview. And if you look at the comments below, uh, yeah, you're going to see that. There's some pretty interesting stuff being said. Uh, and, and just to let you, just to put all curiosity aside, I work independently. I'm not part of any group. Uh, I'm not part of any religious group. I don't have an organization. When I say we, I am talking about the people who listen to these videos who, who chime in and help with the research, who send me stuff, most of the time anonymously. I get sent stuff from people who, you know, tell me that they're in the military, they don't want to reveal their name, and so I don't press it. Most of the people who are giving me documents and sending me links are people who have said, please do not reveal my name. And so I don't. Uh, but the, the Skype teams that I've worked with, they're people like you who wrote and said, hey, wh wh what's your Skype address? And so we've, we've developed teams. Those teams were to write a constitution or uh, articles of confederation for the Respublica of Earth. We've done that, and so that project is finished. Um, but later on, I'll be giving out you know, the, the Skype address again so that anyone who you know wants to get in on groups, discussion groups, can do that. I think that's important to do, as a matter of fact. And so um, it's my intention to get to that. But I, 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 uh, I don't have a belief system. I'm open to all input. I feel like that's the uh, most productive way to go about things right now. Once you're locked in a belief system, then you start looking for things to substantiate what you already believe, and then the risk of missing things is pretty high. And so um, correlation does not necessarily equal causation, but when you've got a, uh, when you've already ascribed to a belief system or a religion, or you've got a group that's taking an angle on something, you tend to make correlations and assume causations that aren't there. So um, let's just put all that to rest. Uh, no, I'm not a New Age person in any way, shape, or form. Um, so those of you who are, please continue to watch if you want to. <laughs> Our world views uh, need to be adjusted. America, Americans have assumed that we were sort of uh, at the top of the heat in the world. And we have um, taken on an attitude of superiority, in general I'm talking now, that um, isn't warranted in any way, shape, or form. The positive side of that, you know how I am, I like to frame things in a positive way if I can. The positive side to that is if we're a little bit cocky and confident, that's going to come in handy because we're going to need that strength. We're going to need our confidence. We like to think of ourselves as a courageous um, people. And so courage doesn't mean no fear. Courage means you take the fear and you use it to your advantage. That's what courage is. There's no such thing as courage if there's not a little bit of fear there. And so that's, uh, you know, where I come from on that. So let's take a look at this report. Put my glasses on here. This is uh, about 60 pages or so. And if you see these titles, Alien Pharmacology for Humans, just take a look at some of this and you know they they studied adrenaline pretty heavily um, the MK Ultra project yeah mind control big time and there's a, some spots on language and, and uh, we'll get to that so um, 
here we see some of their biochemistry stuff. Sorry, the fan on my computer just kicked in, and when that happens, my voice gets drowned out, so I really apologize. Let's go down alien psychic abilities. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm, I'm assuming you're all going to take a look at this on your own. Please do. I'm trying to find, oh, you know, there's the part about the crafts. I want to find the language part, because that's very interesting. Okay, here's what some of the grays look like. A couple of videos ago, you saw in a movie called Jupiter Ascending some grays um, messing with a lady. There are a variety of them. And here are some drawings of some of them. They have names, as you see. There are you know, close to 200 alien races supposedly around here. Some of them are cloned. And uh, this document talks about where, you know, the constellations that they're from. Kind of reminds you of Pope, doesn't he? This is some writing. Talks about the MK Ultra project. That will make y'all dizzy. Well, here's some of their language, Nordic and Pleiadian, Vagan, ancient language, and serious written language. Interesting, huh? Orion, Ontarian, very universal written language. You know, some of you may have gotten some communications that look like this. I, I know I've, I've gotten a hold of some. That I don't know that they were from aliens, but okay. So that's this. I will encourage you to take a look at this. Oh, there's a section on, on cloning. And then the government's philosophy, as you see, the government um, really can't deny this anymore. We have too much stuff. So that's that. The next document I, I want us to look at together is from a man named Paul Benowitz. And he's writing a report. He is a electrical physicist living, uh, he lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, real close to um, an Air Force base where he saw lights and got curious and began uh, observing and doing some research and taking very close notes on what he saw. And of course he had no reason you know to hide what he saw. He thought the military would be interested. Um, I believe it's Kirkland Air Force Base that's in that area. Um, he reported his findings and of course their behavior was a little bit suspicious. Um, subsequently, to make a long story short, he was, uh, some stories be began to circulate that he was set up to believe these things and that his observations were, were fake alien observations that were fed to him by someone. Um, and of course, you know, an astute observer can can see, you know, once the Air Force finds out this stuff with what we know now, they're the ones keeping all this stuff secret. They've enabled this. Um, you know, the Air Force runs are, if you look at several videos ago, I gave you a communication that was pretty startling about mind control, that it was operated through the Air Force. So we know that um, our Draco reptilians have a pretty uh, tight relationship with the Air Force. And so he was made to look like a crazy guy and spent some time in a mental hospital. Later, though, researchers uh, were able to validate his findings. Um, but if you do a, a search, if you Google his name, you'll find a, a lot of, not a lot, but some videos that 
you know, raising the question, well, what really happened? How much of Paul Benowitz's story is true? And some people think he was crazy because there were one or two books written about his story, painting him in a negative light, just like the, the whole Phil Schneider thing. There seems to be a concerted effort to shut people up who have had an experience with these things and talked about it. But anyway, let's, uh, let's take a look. That's the link that I'll send you to the document we just now looked at. Here's Paul Benowitz's report, and I'm not going to read. This is pretty long. Um, let me scroll through just to show you how long it is. That's, that's how long this report is. I'll put this link below the video. But it opens in a pretty interesting way, and I'll read the first paragraph and then some of these points. Uh, he calls this Operation Retaliation, Paul Benowitz, One Man Against an Empire. Following are quotations from a document, actually a detailed report called Project Beta, which was compiled by scientist Paul Benowitz for officials at Kirkland Air Force Base who were working with Benowitz in an operational plan to bring down the alien base at Dolce, New Mexico. That was until other interests deep within the intelligence community got involved and brought enormous pressure against Benowitz and various Kirkland Air Force Base officials. Um, they, they named some of those officials uh, who were involved to cease the investigation. Although Paul was, has apparently been silenced, the discoveries which he has made in regard to the physical, technological aspects of activity taking place in and around Dolce cannot be silenced. Project Beta is apparently a proposed plan for a physical military attack on one of the major or key basing installations of the Draconis Orion Reticuli forces and may be useful in any future attempts to retake the base from alien or alien controlled elements and to set free the human captives who are apparently being held in cold storage or in subterranean prisons deep below the surface of the American Southwest and beyond. Before dealing with the report itself, we will quote some correspondence between Benowitz and others, beginning with excerpts from Paul's March 1986 letter to Clifford Stone, now director of UFO Contact International in Albuquerque. Okay, that's, uh, that's enough right there for a little bit of a head trip, isn't it? Um, they're saying that there was a Project Beta, a plan uh, for a physical military attack on one of the major key basing installations of the Draconis Orion Reticuli forces. You know, I, I'm not sure we should we should go on with this video until we've had a chance to di digest that. Um, this document is claiming that, that there has been a plan to, to rescue some humans being held there. And so, again, as I, as I always say, you know, if someone's saying there are humans down there, whether the report is 10 years old, 20 years old, or 30 years old, we have an obligation to find out and to do more than a perfunctory investigation, to do a very thorough one in, in such a manner that anyone trying to obfuscate or blockade the effort would be exposed and dealt with immediately. Um, and of course, I'm still researching that document. I'm not sure um, if there have been follow-up documents. If, you know, I'm, I'm still working on that. One of the reasons I'm going ahead, I just received this yesterday. One of the reasons I'm going ahead and sharing it with you is so you all can participate and help with this research because the research part needs to get done so that we can take action. If what I am reading in this and other documents is true, the situation could be that um, some draconian forces are feeling threatened by humans and feel that it's time to make their move now. Um, that They uh, don't really care for us that much and they would like to get rid of us. Most of us are, you know, if we take that 
and put that next to our idea, okay, that the feds want to, they've built FEMA camps and the feds want to control us and it's a Nazi thing or a communist thing. Sure, they want you to think that. Um, but it's really a draconian thing. Subterranean races thing. Now, if you'll read some of the stuff that we'll be looking at, you'll discover that they have the ability to take on human, the, the looks of a human. How are they able to do that? Through holographic technology. Technically, we're all kind of holograms, you know. Now, you can do, it, do a search on that and find some really neat information that will help you understand how that's true. We've been using a very retro sort of physics in our culture because if we, you know, if we really understood the kind of physics that they understand, we would be able to manipulate these holograms uh, the same way that they do. I'm told by people who have actually seen these beings and dealt with them that they are able to, they don't need a hole in the ground to pop up. They don't need to pop up into Walmart in order to get to the surface. They can come through stone, they can come through dirt, they, I mean they can come th move through uh, what we think of as solid surfaces. So what it appears, what appears to be so is that these uh, subterranean races um, have surface counterparts in the way of government people who have set up means for them to get supplies through big box stores. And so why are our big box stores closing now? We're waking up and finding out, hey, we don't really like how these things are operating. We're, you know, we're not giving them the kind of business we were. Also, our, the United States is being isolated uh, financially, and so we're not able to, pretty soon we won't be doing the kind of trade that we've been doing internationally. So there's a, a feeling of threat in these bases. So what I'm expecting is a reaction. And I imagine that our military knows this and is helping manage it. What I was told the other day was that I was assuming the militia knew and it's very likely that our militia don't know and our militia need to know okay so what can we do about this that's the beautiful thing if you if you take a look at this document that's why I think this document is very helpful because Paul Benowitz was able to interact with these beings and discover that they operated on fear. Um, and, and the thing about that is, I'm not sure where I read that. Um, I don't want to take up time to, to read verbatim through this when you can read it yourself, but piecing together what I've been told and what I've heard and what I've read, it seems that these beings feed on humans they eat them. Um, in a minute I'm going to play a piece from a researcher who says that. They, uh, they are sort of disempowered. They lose their motivation when there's no comeback or no fear from the, from the people. Um, as you saw in the movie Jupiter Ascending, the Greys, when they're found out, they're like, if, if they can operate under cover and, and in secrecy, they seem to be okay. But the minute we know about them and are looking at them and calling them out, they're like, Phew. that's that's the greys. These the bigger beings that you saw in Jupiter ascending, the ones with wings um, and those you know three-toed feet. I'm told that they have uh, individual personalities. They're not as hivish as the greys. And um, you know, if, if we if we see them, they you know they they'll likely attack. But not always. They have ability to reason. They're sentient. And some of them, you know, depending on how much of the draconian blood they have, um, some of them are even kind. So that's where it gets confusing.
you can't just say, well, all draconians are, are horrible and evil. It takes discernment, and that's where the spiritual part comes in. You know, we need to be able to discern what we're dealing with. And that means reading the energy. And no, that is not new age. That's science, and it's common sense. You know, uh, read the vibe. We do that all the time without realizing it. You know, when the hair on the back of our neck stands up, we're reading the vibe of something. Our body picks up what's going on before our logical conscious mind does. So if we're in our bodies, solidly grounded in our bodies, that's one reason why being grounded is so important, so that we can sense what's going on. Our government controllers are part of this group. They don't like us. They're not for us. Sorry, but they're not. They have, uh, all through the ages, kept us ungrounded with silly things like the pledge to a flag. You know, they didn't have us saying our pledge to our country. They made us think that that's what that was, but we were saying the pledge of allegiance to a flag. That's that's very abstract, you know. It's very ungrounding. They've had us uh, in religious activities. Not spiritual activities, but religious, ritual, stuff that doesn't make sense. But we do it out of habit because our ancestors did it. It's very ungrounding. If we got really got in our body, we'd say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's with the stand up, sit down, kneel to pray, stand to pray? What's up with that? You know? There's just some pieces of logic missing there. So we need to be fully grounded in our bodies, and that's part of what this is about. You know, we've glorified the spiritual uh, and neglected our physicality. And, and it, our physicality is gifted with sensing abilities, just like birds, you know. They sense the magnetic fields. That's how they're able to fly in flocks and and schools of fish, and we humans are like that. We've got those gifts. We've uh, ignored them, and so we don't use them. We're plodding through life, you know, using our beta mind, you know, rather than our intuitive aspects. So if we're in our intuitive aspects, and we're able to sense and move throughout our life that way, uh, these beings can pop up out of nowhere. Yeah, so what? If we're triggerable, we will be triggered. So the recommendation I'm making is that we start working through these triggers. Work through your triggers. If something can set you off, if you've been abused in your background, and a certain look in someone's eyes can set you off, that's really common, by the way. Um, we got to deal with that and, and move that through our energy field. If you've been sexually abused and certain images trigger trigger you. We need to begin resolving that stuff so that we're not so triggerable, so that we are responding to life from a place of groundedness rather than reacting to life from a place of emotional trauma. Okay, actually, I, you know, I was planning on spending more time uh, on the document and I had some videos ready to share, but I've just shared a whole bunch of stuff. So I think what I'm going to do is wrap it up for right now and, um, We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Bye now. Wow. Well, I think if you want to hear shocking, paradigm-shifting information, if that was for you, you want to hear from, from somebody like Cindy K. Curry. Because even though she might be wrong, she's definitely honest. And in this case, I don't think she's wrong. We're going to leave the links to those two particular articles below our video too, so that you can read them. They're pretty fascinating. Also, uh, she dealt with a few topics. One was um, underground civilizations. We did a whole podcast on underground civilizations. I think it's, it's only an hour long, but it's uh, podcast number 111. It's called Magic Sorcery and the secret underground civilizations, because Mindy and I have actually had some strange experiences with underground civilizations that you'll learn about if you happen to click on that one. Also, we did, after that, we got so involved in that subject that we did two episodes on Bill Cooper's 
a book called Behold a Pale Horse. So you'll be interested in that too. If you want to get into that topic and know a little bit more background. Now, if you just said, if it has to do with aliens or anything like that, I just can't go there. I want you to remember that how you're going to expand your consciousness, how you're going to learn what's real is by exploring what's outside. And in terms of the Dulcie base and in terms of the underground um, network of highways and tunnels, they have tunnel, supposedly they have tunnel burrowing um, machines that can burrow wide tunnels. They turn the uh, walls of the tunnel into glass-like uh, substances, and they can go miles in a day. So the fact that they've got these is no surprise. The technology is there. Actually, before Phil Snyder was killed, he was talking about that type of technology because that was his field. Also, um, let me just comment on the two documents after I went through them. Uh, the one about the alien papers, that's fascinating. I, I've done a little work with uh, UFOs and aliens, and that's a, it's a really neat little comprehensive uh, look at certain facts about aliens. Now, is it an official paper? I don't have any idea where it came from. But I put it in the back of my mind, and uh, I go from there. Actually, one of the drawings was very similar to a drawing that was shown to me by a very close friend who was an abductee. Um, so that was interesting. Paul Benowitz. Well, the establishment is working really hard to discredit Paul Benowitz. And the first thing I clicked on to investigate him was uh, Wikipedia. And of course, Wikipedia discredits him. So to me, that gave him a lot of credibility. I wanted to learn more about this guy. And from reading different things on the internet, it seems to me that Paul Benowitz was a really honest guy who had discovered something. He saw them coming and going. He could, he could uh, hear their communications. And he kind of was, was warning uh, what he thought was uh, his government to be, be aware something's going on here. But I think what the government was doing is they were humoring him to find out just how close someone could get or how much they could learn. And they would feed him a little information once in a while. But I think that's a good paper and you should read it because this man, he truly believed. And some of the, some of the information he got from his own sources, he took videos, he showed the videos to the uh, Air Force. So it's interesting, and it's interesting to learn about Paul Benowitz. Uh, before we go to break, well, no, let's just go to break. And then when we come back, I've got a really interesting little piece of a tape that came out of our World Beyond Belief episode 109, where we, we were investigating uh, aliens and UFOs. And this is an interesting uh, statement from Stephen Greer. Now, I don't know whether you know who Stephen Greer is, but Dr. Stephen Greer was head of the SETI project, and he was uh, also head of uh, the uh, Disclosure Project. I think both of them were sponsored by Rockefellers, and when you work for the Rockefellers, you kind of do what they tell you. But for some reason, I like the guy, and uh, we have some of his statement coming up after the break. So let's go to break it and we'll come back with more of the world beyond belief. Well, welcome back to the World Beyond Belief. I hope that you're still buckled in and ready to go into more deeply into the fringe than you ever thought you'd have to. 
But then when you click on something called World Beyond Belief, you know, you're kind of asking for it. So anyway, let me tell you that we were doing a, a, a program on uh, World Beyond Belief for, uh, uh, we were going to study aliens, and we certainly had to check out what was going on, on on the Disclosure Project, even though I know that it was sponsored by Lawrence Rockefeller. So uh, we tuned in to, li I listened to a lot of Stephen Greer, and I noticed that he was saying that, and number one, all aliens are benevolent, which kind of gave us a kind of a start. But let's uh, tune in on episode 109 of The World Beyond Belief. Now, you'll notice that there was an attempt back then for us to be uh, entertaining. So it's a little more jazzy than the World Beyond Beliefs now. It's, it's even more beyond belief than these are. So here we go with ep episode 109, a little piece of it, where we listen to Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer. This is an effort headed up by Dr. Stephen M. Greer that was started very, very ceremoniously in the May of 2001. It's a collection of people that might know something about the alien presence. Now, the idea of this sounds, sounds wonderful. Everybody's going to tell what they know. Uh, and we're going to find get to the bottom of this picture of what's going on with the alien presence here. Now, this does presuppose that these people who were sworn to secrecy and in high-level top, top secret positions on this issue uh, will now come clean. I'm not, I'm not sure how likely that is. And the second thing seems to indicate that it was at least partially funded by Lawrence Rockefeller, although if you go back and search the web, find evidence of that it's all been wiped clean. The only thing that's left are conversations talking about the evidence that he was involved. So I'm not saying he was involved, but you know, so to me going into this, this is it's a little suspect. But the, after 10 years, Greer and his team found an amazing, amazing finding. that the total alien presence involved with the human race on the planet Earth is benevolent. Say what? Yeah, yeah, it surprised me too. Let's hear this from Dr. Greer himself. Even though there's no evidence that they're a threat, I want to be very clear on this. There's no objective evidence that anyone has been harmed by these visitors. And there's certainly no evidence that they're a threat to us. But Stephen, Stephen, what about the whole abduction phenomenon? Isn't that kidnapping against people's wills? What about implants they're taking out? That's against people's will. What about the cattle and human mutilations? Or the greys and reptilians uh, just terrifying humans all over the globe? What about anal probes? They don't even buy dinner first. That doesn't sound too benevolent to me. But Stephen Greer explains. Of course, you know, in the pop culture, everyone thinks of the big bug-eyed greys or the reptilians, which, of course, ironically, are the ones that are man-made program life forms that are uh, genetically uh, created creatures. And uh, many people that have worked in those projects have come forward to, to describe to us exactly how that's done. So the irony is that the public perception of ET is actually the disinformation man-made image, and the actual ETs that have been retrieved aren't very much like that. Hold on just a minute. Did he just say that the ET that everyone recognizes from their abduction experiences and all the information that we found out, those are made by the government. They're man-made, genetically created creatures. Yeah, we have to assume it's the government because there's nobody else who can put together the money and well, that, do, do that, something that diabolical as far as I'm concerned. So that totally explains too, while people who say that they are abducted, then they have government surveillance watching over them in addition to their abduction right. experience. It, actually, it makes perfect sense because, oh, 20 years ago, I was in a workshop with Carla Turner. 
Well, now you know why we don't try to be entertaining anymore. We just try to get some information out. We're, we're not very funny and not very entertaining. But anyway, uh, through that interview, oh, it ended with Carla Turner. And uh, I go in, I think, into depth on my encounter with those 60 abductees on, on that podcast. But you'll have to go back there because I don't have time today to do that, do that thing. So we're just going to move along and we're going to summarize what Stephen Greer said, told us. Stephen Greer says that all the aliens are benevolent. Now, I have a hard time thinking of any, all of anything being benevolent in this world of, uh, of dichotomies. Uh, but second of all, he says that what we refer to as grays and uh, reptilians are just hybrid species bred by humans. I don't think that's true. I think that they work in conjunction with the humans. I think that we have made packs with the, uh, the grays and the reptilians, especially the reptilians that are earth reptilians, because there are there are a lot of different species of reptilians, and there's one that's native to uh, this earth. And uh, so we made packs with them. And if you want to find out more about that, you can go to um, Bill Cooper's book called um, Behold a Pale Horse. That's what it is. Behold a Pale Horse by William Cooper. It's, a, it's available free on the internet, and it's a fascinating read. We did a couple episodes on it, but it'll, it'll give you the basis for the relationship between those types of, I don't even know if, I think if a, if a, if a being in his species or her species is notice, uh, native to uh, the earth, it's hard to call them aliens. But there are different species than we are. And apparently we've done a lot of work with, um, with them and a lot of treaties and a lot of treaties were broken. And so the history unfolds. But what I want to focus on, since we're talking about the Southwest and we're talking about Jade Helm and why they would be putting all their military equipment and people and they're running a jade helm it might have to do with the fact that the southwest is home to a lot of these deep underground bases that are populated by aliens and humans and alien human hybrids uh, one of the most distressing of those is the dulcie base now we've driven by uh, that area of the country, and just knowing that the Dulcie base was there creeped us out. I think that the Southwest is kind of a, I don't know, in my mind, it's kind of a creepy area down there because of all the different um, supposedly alien bases and uh, the DUMs, which are deep underground bases, and uh, a lot of the the crashes in Roswell were, were around there. I mean, it's got a, a deep history in ETs. So the whole area kind of creeps me out. But let me tell you about Dulcie and the Dulcie base. Now, the Dulcie base was the scene of the famous Dulcie Wars, which took place in the late 70s, early 80s. And it was kind of a rebellion because of what, what's going on at that Dulcie base. And uh, it's a real deep secret. Uh, there's only three people that actually talk about it. One of them's Phil Snyder, and Phil Snyder was uh, killed, as you saw uh, in the uh, in the video before. Uh, the other guy's name is Thomas Costello, and he tried to escape and get away, but he was eventually taken out too. The other guy is Mark Richards. And Mark Richards is held in prison. 
He's in like solitary confinement. He can be talked to, but if anybody goes to talk to him, they can't take any video equipment. They can't take any notes. They're searched before and after. And so that's, they're trying to keep the information about the Dulce base quiet. That's why you didn't hear anybody talking about the Dulce base and Jade Helm, because my goodness, you can't know about the Dulce base. Only crazy conspiracy theorists and alien hunters uh, talk about the Dulce base. Well, let's first of all talk a little bit about Phil Snyder. Before we do, though, we're into the fringe, and we're talking about information that's uh, the mainline media is never going to give you unless they do a unless they do a documentary on the Dulce base in which time it's going to give you as much misinformation as it gives you information, and it's going to end up um, with your being convinced that it's a conspiracy theory. But we're going into it in this program kind of for real, uh, because I really do think that there's some credibility there, and I think there is something there. There's just too many people with collaborating evidence, and it's such an outrageous uh, situation there that, I don't know, you know, it's one of those things where it's stranger than fiction. You can't make this shit up, you know? So, so let's get into Phil Snyder. Phil Snyder's contribution was he was an engineer, and I used to work with engineers a lot. I know he's an engineer. I know the way he thinks, and he is an engineer. I mean, he, w he would go into technical deep technical details at the drop of a hat if he if he could but he building these underground tunnels encountered um, reptilians and they ended up having a firefight uh, in which he was uh, seriously injured he had his uh, had several fingers taken off and uh, he was able to kill them shoot them now, these aliens were reptilians, and they were, you know, like six or seven feet tall, normal reptilians. They're probably the Earth, native Earth reptilians. Uh, there are certain breeds of reptilians, like the Draco reptilians, which are much bigger and are said to be winged. Uh, so if I were encountering them, well, you know, I'd want a real, a real dangerous weapon. I'd probably want hollow tip bullets or something, you know, to, to deal with that kind of a, of a threat. But anyway, he, uh, he killed a few, so we know that when they're in, I, I don't know whether they're shapeshifters or not, but they're able to be, to be killed. And as far as I'm concerned, that, you really need to go and, and, and listen to Phil Snyder's testimonies, S-C-H and E-I-D-E-R, and uh, see what you think. See if you think he's credible. See if you think he's a whack job. I think he's credible. And uh, unless I see something otherwise, um, you know, I'm going to stick with Phil. The other guy that you can't see but, but did a lot of testimony is Costello. Thomas Costello. Now, Thomas Costello worked in security at the Dulce base. So he was down there and he was on the different floors. And the different floors have different hmm, different jobs, different things that are located on these floors. And this guy, uh, Tom Costello, was a human. So he had a heart. Even though he had worked for the Rand Corporation, which is, of course, everybody knows that watches World Beyond Belief that that's a Tavistock creation, uh, he still had his humanity about him. And so he mounted a rebellion. And the reason he did is because of the horrible things that, are, that were going on on that base. Now, there was a, there's another reporter. Her name was Sherry Schreiner. And she wrote a thing called The Prisoners of Dulce Base. And if you're into this, pull that up on the web by Sherry Schreiner, S-H-R-I-N-E-R. We'll leave a link below. Prisoners of the Dulce Base. 
and it's at www.sherryshriner.com. It's a well-written article, has a lot of information in it, and uh, I'm going to have Mindy read you a little bit of Sherry's article about what were in these different levels at the Dulce base. Before she reads this, I want to tell you how good she's doing with the Camtasia. <laughs> she's trying to operate the Camtasia, and I'm trying to fill in the content. And between the two of us, we're getting through it anyway. Back to the Dulce base. <laughs> All right. From midway through the document, the Dulce base was built on top of deep caverns that extend for hundreds of miles underground. There are seven levels of the Dulce base that are known of. The caverns underneath are off limits, and even most of the levels themselves are not accessible without strict security clearance to those who qualify to be on them. The first three levels contain government offices and a garage for street maintenance. The base itself is as large as the city of Manhattan. Yes, they have roads and electric vehicles to drive. The second level contains offices and a garage for trains, shuttles, tunnel boring machines, and UFO maintenance. The third level is mostly government offices. The fourth level of the Dulce Base conducts research and experiments on the human psyche, dream manipulation, hypnosis, and telepathy. All aspects of mind control programming take place here as well. Witnesses have described huge vats containing amber liquid with human body parts on the fifth level that are constantly stirred by a robotic arm. Rows and rows, thousands of cages have also been seen holding men, women, and children to be used as food and put into these vats for the aliens. The sixth level is called Nightmare Hall. It contains the genetic labs and this is where the crossbreeding experiments of humans and animals are conducted. People have reportedly seen fish, seals, birds, and mice that are vastly altered from their original creations. There are multi-armed and multi-legged humans and several cages of vats of humanoid bat-like creatures up to seven feet tall. Seven foot humans with wings and bat-like features. On the seventh level are thousands and thousands of humans in cold storage, including children. Well, the seven feet seven mothmen were described as mothmen. And this is, it's a horrible scenario. And this has been going on since at least the 50s. And some suspect that the treaty that was signed to allow these um, reptilians and greys to operate this type of facility in conjunction with the, the armed forces uh, has been broken and they're doing a lot more than they than the human agreed for them to do. Although to me the uh, controllers of this world seem to be so basically evil that I can see why they'd even They'd even go along with it. Uh, anyway, this base is connected with the other bases by high stream highways. And these bases are all over the world. So when we're getting ready for Jade Helm, we have to have military hardware on top of all these bases all over the world. Supposedly, there's a high speed uh, transportation system under there that goes from one to the other. And... Uh, it's quite, it's quite a setup. Well, Thomas Costello couldn't stand it. Like any human being that was working there and had a heart and was compassionate, he couldn't stand it. So he fomented a revolt, revolt. And they tried to take over and shut down the Dulcie base. Now, it didn't happen. But I think the most interesting thing about this and I'm, I'm going on memory with this uh, Thomas Costello story. But the most interesting thing that I can remember was that some of the reptilians 
were on the side of the humans trying to break down this base. Some of them were, were reptilians. And I've heard that as the consciousness awakes on this planet, that some of these other species, and not just earthly species like uh, dogs and cats and cows and birds, are going to experience an awakening also, and they'll move up to the next level. But also, some of these species of non-human, humanoid type creatures are going to benefit from our awakening. So I think some of them are, are cool to that, and they realize, and some of them, it sounds like, might have a heart and might be might be working on our behalf. But anyway, this 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 Dulce base and all these underground bases, you know there's a base under um, Denver International Airport. Supposedly, it has 85 square miles of floor space under there. And it's supposedly mostly humans. And the Dulce base, I think, is mostly reptilian or or gray, or, or whatever. But what they're doing there is they're doing experiments on, on humans, on mind control, on dream control, on controlling the spirit inside, taking the spirit out and letting a demon come in. I mean, these are horrible things. And they eat humans, which is when, which is why when I saw the Tupperware coffins that are being prepared for whatever's coming up, then my, my immediate thought was, oh my God, oh my God, are we going to, are we going to package people? I, I mean, is this, is this, is what, is this what we're doing? Is this, a, is this an appeasement exercise for the folks at Dulcie? Well, not the folks at Dulcie, the the creepy reptilian folks at, at Dulcie. But just like Curry said, don't paint all reptilians with a bad brush. I think that uh, the upper level reptilians, well, I, I really don't know. But I think that uh, it's, it's like labeling, it's like uh, generalizing about anything when you generalize about them. And she gave really good advice. Use your heart. And also, they run, they run on fear. See, they're a distortion in the matrix. So uh, fear is a distortion of the matrix. So when you're with them, to feed them, you have to be afraid. <laughs> I guess you would be. They're, they're huge. They're menacing looking. Um, and they can come, come right up out of the wall at you. But if you're afraid of them, you feed them. You give that distortion energy. So the trick is, if you can control yourself when you're faced with something like this, um, when you, if you're not afraid, if you think, if you remember that there were some reptilians that were, that were fighting on the side of the human in the Dulcie Wars, then you'll, you might be able to think, well, you know, let's not paint them all green or whatever. Anyway, let's move along. Uh, what happened to Tom Costello is he, he survived the Dulcie Wars and he went into hiding and he tried to get his wife and kids out of, out of the country and, and hide them. But it's very difficult when you're trying to hide from, uh, you know, the total surveillance state, when you're trying to hide from uh, creatures with incredibly advanced advanced technology. And finally, well, I, I actually don't know what happened to him, but I know he's not around anymore. So anyway, that's the story of Tom Costello, as much as I know about it. The other guy is really interesting. He still survives. His name's Mark Richards. And he, uh, I think he was involved in the Dulcie War also. He was an officer. And what happened to him was they convicted him of a murder that he didn't commit. Now, this murder couldn't have been done by him 
uh, because he was not even around the area at the time. So he was framed and convicted, put in solitary confinement, life imprisonment, and he can only have visitors. And the visitors are limited. They can't take pictures. They can't tape. They can't write notes because he knows too much. Um, so he's existing there. They're trying to keep that information about the Dulce base out of our information reservoir. <laughs> anyway, but Kerry Cassidy was able to go in and interview him. And after she came out, she got in her car and she did a quick summary of what he told her. And I think that would be a real interesting thing to look at right now. Let's do that. This is Carrie Cassidy, and I've just come back from interviewing Mark Richards in the Vacaville prison. Uh, and this has been a fascinating experience, I have to say. Um, way over the top. I mean, just amazing. Very interesting man. Uh, definitely a military man of G Germanic and British uh, background, heritage, DNA, you know, all of that. Um, very, very knowledgeable about the secret space program and everything attendant on that. Um, I literally peppered him with questions nonstop. Um, I can tell you that for all intents and purposes, he is exactly who he says he is. This is, this is what appears to be the truth. Um, he was, uh, you know, very, very well informed very well read, very, um, very gracious, uh, very astute, uh, and answered all of my questions very clearly. There was no sort of attempts, or at least no obvious attempts at obfuscation. Uh, and I'm going to just re out, reel out the information I was given, which in some cases is, uh, is kind of mind-blowing and and yet a validation of most of what I've been given or what I know for the, the eight years in Camelot. I can say that this is a person who really knows what he's talking about and who is able to answer me from his own experience, very direct experience. He has been a captain in the military, uh, in the Navy. His father was a, I guess, a high-ranking uh, Air Force uh, person and also in the military. Both of them were in the secret space program. Um, and what I, the kinds of questions I asked him had to do with getting verification on who's running the planet, uh, what the various races are that are visiting here and that are interacting with humans and aligning themselves with various countries, governments, and military factions. Um, and, and, and so I was really asking him very high level, sophisticated, kinds of questions it wasn't just you know what kind of alien what do they look like although we do have some of that in there there is very clearly he made some very clear statements uh, that I will state here um, and again this is this is me all going off my memory from uh, just you know having been there for about two hours in conversation with him and I didn't have any pen or paper wasn't allowed to keep notes of any kind so everything comes off my memory we're doing this right now so that I will have a clear uh, record and so that I can also document this for the public of what I've learned and apparently it appears that he was given an okay to release this information gradually and uh, I am the first person who's gone to interview him on a, on a sort of, you might call it an official capacity. There have apparently been a few visitors that are friends, you know, became friends of him and, and Joanne, his wife. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this is the very first time he's ever been interviewed in this way and for the purposes of release to the public. Um, I can say that he talked about races of, of ETs that he dealt with directly um, through the years. And, and they involve, uh, first and foremost, the, what he calls the raptors. And the raptor race being a group uh, that look like the velociraptors to some degree. Uh, and I guess maybe they're even descended from them. That they, are, uh, they consider the earth theirs. That they're an indigenous uh, species to the earth. 
and that they um, that they really did die out or actually they, they left during the, the um, you know the end of the dinosaur e era but then some survived and then they returned apparently and um, that they are interacting very directly with our military that they have a joint base um, and joint operations going on or had in the Falkland, Falklands and that a current I believe current base down there and it is um, that they are a species that they, they you know they really do look like the the pictures of them like this in uh, you know Jurassic Park uh, and that they love our uh, luxury items I was told that they also love cars luxury cars and things like that that they have a family a set of family values that they their first approach to us uh, that was back in if I remember correctly 1951 give or take and that they uh, their interaction was initially uh, sort of uh, negative with our race uh, but once they established relationships we have become um, I guess tacit colleagues uh, they call us allies humans allies and uh, that their initial impulse is to eat humans and that they still can you know do so at any given point if they get mad or whatever um, I was given an example that you know somebody could be having a friendly relationship, you know, talking with them, and that if they got angry, they could turn around and eat the child, the a kid, you know, um, that they like to eat humans, uh, but that when you get in these military relationships with them, uh, that they refrain, you know, the way you could imagine uh, sort of a, a vampire might refrain. In other words, they still have the capacity, but they refrain from exercising it. Um, so they have been establishing and evolving over the last 40 years or 50 years or whatever it is, um, and their relationship with our humans, with the humans, and that they um, they have a very close relationship with Mark Richards, actually, uh, who seems to have a very good friend who is among them. What he did describe was relationships that, as they exist between military and various alien races, that are not uniform. In other words, that they have, you know, sort of some individuals, but actually factions within each group that may be, you know, more predisposed to be favorable towards humans than less, and then others that are less so, even within the same races. But that I did ask him, like, overall agendas for each group, that there are two races of reptilians uh, that are, that there are actually, you know, many more races of reptilians, but there are two major races of reptilians that are uh, antagonistic towards humans that want to take over the earth, take back the earth, for their own, they do consider it that they own the race, the, the earth also, that are battling with the ra raptor race uh, for, uh, for ownership of the earth, um, and, uh, and that the humans are helping the raptors, and the ra raptors are helping the humans, the two, to battle these reptilian races, these two races, that both have differing, differing agendas, but more, more or less have to do with taking back the earth. One group of reptilians is humanoid, more humanoid, standing on their, their legs and so on, and, and has a more human-like, and has even lost over time uh, their tail and so on and so forth. And they, um, then there's another race that is, is like a more traditional reptoid-looking race with tails, and um, neither of those are positively oriented towards humans for the most part. There is a group of Draco, they, are, they have the wings, we know of them as the Shikars. They, uh, we didn't get a lot of time to discuss that, but um, he did talk about them being um, a, a different race altogether. Uh, and then there are, in other words, there are so many different races here uh, that are even operational here that are coming in and out of the planet and also that our atmosphere is very um, hard for them to deal with for the most part. He did agree that the terraforming of the planet, as I have stated in Camelot numerous times, with the methane and the, uh, the, the Fukushima disaster having, involving uh, radiation, is an effort to, uh, to terraform the planet to make it more, uh, you know, amenable to certain races of, of, rep, of beings, including the reptilians, so that they can be in our atmosphere more easily. 
that is the agenda. That is one of the agendas. The other, and I, I know I'm sort of I'm going to be jumping around because I have to grab my memory from all the different areas that we talked about. But basically, um, what happens is that they are terraforming this planet. They are looking to take the uh, the radiation create um, a, a humanity 2.0 they're looking for mutants just as the the x-men movie states in other words that radiation can then cause mutations that can be positive mutations for a race of beings and what that's what they're hoping to land on is some more superpowers access to to that certainly i think um, being able to to travel in space more easily for example the better you can withstand radiation uh, we talked about so many things. It, this is going to be, you know, I'm just going to like fire, you know, like a shotgun kind of thing here because it was it was really quite substantial. I mean, I barely gave him any time to, <laughs> to breathe because I was, you know, asking him things just like that. And at no point did he even, you know, hesitate. And when he didn't know something, he was clear. He he. If I said something that was too general, he he asked me to be more specific. He was. We were. We did have a good rapport and we're easily able to talk to each other he is a typical um he comes from a germanic uh english background he has blue eyes and uh you know light skin um looks fairly germanic uh he would definitely is a, a high ranking officer in the secret space program he was framed he uh the murder actually happened when he wasn't even here he was on an assignment and specifically uh having come come right come back and was having a, a meal with his mother when the actual I guess thing occurred um, but for all intents and purposes he was not able to defend himself because he was away on a mission during the time when the plotting was supposed to be going on and all these other things that he's been accused of um, and certainly you can't use your secret mission as a defense in a in a proceeding of this nature um, because it violates the security oath for one thing and for the another thing um, no one believe him um, he uh, uh, okay so there are also um, we talked about the greys we talked about Dulce the Dulce battle he talked about violence as being a, a real last resort that in some he said in some ways they were kind of young and naive and back in those days during the Dulce battle um, that they went in and it were supposed to be sort of uh, a friendly threat rather than an overt threat or rather than a down and out battle but it d devolved to into a battle um, because they simply didn't know how to handle it and ended up having to to uh, to, to kill a number of uh, you know the greys etc um, in order to try to free the humans that are being experimented on there he agreed with me that he said that they were sent in by Carter and that that uh, prior to that, I questioned him about Eisenhower and the witnesses that out that is out there, talking about uh, the, the the that they went in to invade during the uh, Eisenhower administration. And he said Eisenhower one of the place nuked, and in fact, nuking is one of the ways that they do go in and they are fighting battles. Um, he uh, he talked about uh, you know the fact that there was uh, Sean David Morton has got a, new, a whistleblower that he wrote a book about and so I was curious whether that whistle whistleblower testimony was correct uh, and and basically apparently it is uh, there was or is a, um, a an alien who runs that place who is not a gray most of the grays are clones he says they use these interdimensional gates that uh, require them to dematerialize and when they rematerialize on the other end they're not the same being and the humans can do the same thing but that they uh, they hesitate and most of them like even Mark himself will not go through certain kinds of gates that require them to dematerialize because when they reappear on the other side they basically have to die to show up there they do show up in their same human form with all their memories intact etc but they're not the same exact being as the one who left there it's a it's a, a duplicate so to speak uh, and then if they come back and they cross back over they again have to die dematerialize and rematerialize again in the same you know configuration which we have but but he said it's a very it's detrimental uh, there tends to be a degrad degrading uh, process that goes on in those kind of gates 
and uh, that that he declined to use them as a result. He said the Greys use them, however, all the time, and that's part of the reason that their race is so so de de devolved on on certain physical levels. And and he also says it also affects the mental. He does say that he himself was augmented uh, with. Uh, I asked him if his tent intelligence was augmented and other other capacities. He alluded to the fact that. Yes, he has been augmented, as many of the secret space program military have been, uh, and, and most of the people that I've talked to that are part of that program, especially on the more secret side, um, and this is even before the, de the days of what we call super soldiers, he said, but there's a great deal of truth in the super soldier story um, that that you know involves augmentation and, and what I call robotic Superman and verified that that is their agenda that is being carried out um, and that the nano is the most he thinks the most dangerous side of that um, and he said he's had direct experience with the nano uh, although we didn't have time to talk about in what way um, so so okay so so I was very interested to know who's running planet Earth, and in the bottom line, he said, is no one is running planet Earth because they're all more or less uh, at, at war with each other. <laughs> Within the various races of ETs that are visiting here, some of whom that believe they live, you know, they own the planet, as well as um, the humans. In other words, just as we have no countries that really, you know, they're all at different agendas, this is what we have in the alien side of things. And he said, if anything, it's more complex than the, than the human relations here on planet Earth, politically and other, otherwise. Um, so, it, but we did talk about, like, the Zacharias Sitchin Anunnaki, the conception of the humanoid, very tall beings that are depicted on the temples. And, and he verified that those are indeed the, those beings and that they did look like that or do. And um, he is he is not does, did not seem certain as to whether people uh, beings like Enki or Enlil are still alive and uh, whether or not they would be returning at this time. We did talk about the return of Mardu. Um, he indicated that there's some possibility that that's there's some truth there, but again that 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 they don't run the earth. Um, maybe they want to be, but they're not. And uh, he did say that the group in Sumer, Sumer, Sumer uh, were reptilian, however, um, and that they looked reptilian, and that they um, they are related to the ones that are actually running the Vatican at this time, which he did verify is a group of reptilians, um, and that there. When I talked about um, one of the significant areas that I had put out there that I tapped into on a psychic level, which had to do with Obama. Uh, during the coron so-called coronation, or whatever they call it, of the new pope, who is indeed a Nazi, um, and therefore the no Nazis have a relationship even through DNA to the reptilian factions. Um, he said that that indeed that when Obama went to pay um, homage, you know, to to Israel, that underground in in Demona and all of that, that there does seem to be that's where uh, the base of the Anunnaki what we know of as these humanoid Anunnaki are, and from what I understood, and that indeed the, the, that Biden went to pay, you know, respects to the, the new Pope was the sort of a nod to that, but, but basically a statement by the United States in essence saying that we are not going to necessarily bow down to the Nazi uh, contingent that's running the Vatican. Um, he, he did talk uh, very specifically, we talked about some new information i would gotten recently having to do with the Chinese and where the Chinese are at. He agreed that the Chinese are dealing with some a new race of beings that is giving them new technology. Um, and I've been told that it wants them to, in essence, run the world. But he, he did not feel that they are taking over the financial system. Contrary to, to some reports I was getting lately, he does not feel that they are... Um, he had not heard that there was a contingent of elders that had gone to, to try to make a deal in uh, in Britain, basically sidelining the Rothschilds and the and the Bushes, Bush cabal. He said that the uh, Chinese were not going to be running the financial system, from what he knows, um, and that they were barely making it. And he said that that actually they're going to be hard pressed in the next five years to keep 
themselves going. Uh, he thinks that they're going to have a civil war, that the people, the Chinese people, are actually in rebellion against their leaders in China, and that there is going to be uh, a civil war as a result. Um, he did. I did ask him if, if as I felt that the that the that the secret space program, you know, is run for the most part by the U.S. humans uh, military, and he agreed that that was for the most part the case. But he did say that they had been very much uh, beleaguered uh, financially by uh, the problems that have been happening here on planet Earth, and that money does seem to have the medium of exchange does seem to inter interrupt or or dampen their ability to do the kinds of things with the secret space program they would like to be doing um, and has dampened some of their their strength on a certain level um, he obviously the secret space program is worked in in connection with various alien groups and we talked about which groups are out there which groups are are aligned positively with the humans and which are not um, we talked about what is known as the Galactic Federation we also talked about another group that's called the collective and we talked about um, as I said the reptilians and the raptors so it seems to be divided into those kind of groups in terms of of, of factions that are at least the ones you can address um, without going into so much detail and as to all the different races beyond that. And there are groups also that go interdimensionally. We didn't have time to talk about all of that, but uh, there apparently there, there are many different kinds of gates here, stargates on the planet, some of which are, are natural stargates that uh, involve as this um, sort of vortexes and uh, some that involved and go you can go to the moon and Mars he said the most easy thing to transport is is material items uh, more so than than physical beings but that you can definitely take the the, the gates and that he and his father both took gates um, on a regular basis between here and, and the moon and Mars um, I'd asked him if it degraded, you know, if it was a problem physically to take a gate, because I remember that Henry Deacon had talked about and, and uh, complains of some of his, his health problems as a result of using the gates. And he did talk about, say that that was uh, one of the results. Um, let's see. Uh, God, um, there's so much, and I, I'm going to try to try to grasp it as quickly as I can. He talked about Eisenhower meeting at, um, you know, at just as, as is in the in the public domain, um, you know, with the groups of aliens. He talked about we talked about Nordics um, from a lot. Okay, so there, I, I had a theory uh, that there not all the Nordics are are so friendly to our agenda. Uh, certainly, there are some Nordics that are. He did say that the Pleiadians and Nordics are different races and that they look different. And the one way you could tell was that the Nordics actually have white blonde hair uh, and, and some other dis different physicality, but the Pleiadians have hair my color. Um, and, you know, he doesn't know anything about the Billy Meyer stories, so he I asked him about that. Um, he talked about, we talked about the AI, I asked him if there was an AI running Earth. He said there is not, however, there is a lot of danger from AI. It's one of their biggest so-called potential enemies are the various races that have AI. And um, that he also talked about the humans that are now walking around that have um, been taken over by AI. Um, he talked about the uh, the fact that we do have, uh, we are protected here on planet Earth. Um, it sounded a little like, he said we were like Israel is to the, the rest of the world, in a sense that they have their protectors that keep them alive. But the, some of their protectors are not necessarily their friends, but that they kind of, it's like a tacit peace in which they acknowledge that they can't just, you know, get rid of all the human race because uh, because they will they will bring war down upon them so they kind of have a, a tacit truce if you will to allow humanity to be on the planet 
He said, but it, if it wasn't for the fighting between the races that are here and visiting and with various agendas, that humanity wouldn't have lived this long on this planet at all because there are a lot of them that would like to do away with humanity altogether. So it's kind of like the fighting, you know, the friend of my friend is my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. Um, he, he talked about why, you know, because we talked about why is, is there secrecy and, and uh, the fact that all the races, including the humans, are in complete agreement that this secrecy has to continue because humanity is not ready to deal with the reality of the ET presence, which has nothing to do with how, you know, what the various ETs races look like and that we could handle what they look like. What we can't handle is, is how they act. In other words, the fact that they want to eat us. Um, that there are a number of those races out there that basically want to, you know, eat us for dinner. And so that we, you know, that that, 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 that mentality of going out and dealing with these races and knowing that, you know, any moment they want to eat you um, was something that humanity couldn't handle. Well... How about that? I'll tell you what, if that doesn't make you relaxed about Jade Helm and what's going on, give you a little bit more comfort to to feel like you know what's going on out there, I don't think anything will. That was a scary bunch of information, and I wanted to make sure that we got a little bit more of the whole picture. Now, we don't know much about the Galactic Federation or what's going on out in space, but we do have insiders that get a handle on what's going on down under. And there's, there's, there's treaties that were made. If we could get a hold of those treaties, we'd know what was going on. Uh, I thought it was an interesting question when she asked, who's running the planet? And uh, Mark said he didn't, he didn't know. Because I always wonder, uh, you know, we know the, uh, the Rothschild Rockefeller dynasty. Uh, I don't think that they're totally human. I think they're a hybrid species and uh, that they they work with an inter another interdimensional species. Oh, they don't consider themselves human. They consider themselves blue bloods, uh, an extra measure of copper in their bloods, and they try to keep their, their, their race clean. So I don't consider them to be humans. They're kind of a hybrid race that because of their... Uh, hybrid nature and the power of whoever they're hybrid with, with, with humans, they're able to, it looks like they're running the planet. Now, after World War II, you know that um, the, this uh, Rockefeller Rothschild dynasty that uh, orchestrated the war sent uh, Admiral Byrd down to Antarctica. Uh, and he was ostensibly on a, on a mission to map something down there. But he took several battleships. I think he might even take a submarine. He took an aircraft carrier. And he encountered uh, heavy opposition. And he said initially, after he got back to Argentina, to the press that if we ever fight another war, it'll be against uh, beings that are able to fly from pole to pole without refueling. Uh, and I think it was in a time period, too. They were very fast. So it looks like there was another, like my, maybe the, the Nazi or the Fourth Reich could be another faction that might buy with the Rockefellers for, for power. Among the, I don't know whether you can call them human. I wouldn't call the Rockefeller Rothschilds human. I would call, maybe maybe the Fourth Reich is more human or maybe they're, an inter, inter, interdimensional species or, or something also. And then you have uh, a very powerful contingency that live under the uh, Tibetan mountains. Uh, they, they either live in Agartha or Shambhala. And uh, they actually, they were aiding uh, Adolf Hitler <laughs> during World War II. There's evidence that they were found in Berlin uh, dead after after the war. So, you know, even among the human factors, or, or I'm not going to call them human because I, I'm not sure they are. I know that we're human. I know that when someone wakes up in the morning and hugs their child and 
uh, make sure that their family's happy, they're human. I know that highly evolved humans see everyone as themselves and they want to make sure that everybody is doing well. They don't naturally, without agitation, without corruption, pursue wars. They're, uh, they're lovers. Uh, and I think love is the natural unfolding of, of the universe, uh, certainly of human consciousness. And that fear and hate and war is a distortion in that consciousness. So, kind of how do we deal with Jade Helm? Because we know that it doesn't, you know, all the, all the military equipment, everything's being put down over top of this, this nasty alien invaded uh, underground civilizations. And these things aren't just in the Southwest. They're, they're all over the world, and actually they're connected by high-speed um, tunnels. And uh, so, there's, so there's a network of these, they're not human, uh, they're, they're different types of species. And I think they all uh, encapsulate different types or different degrees of the distortion that makes our lovely, wonderful, beautiful, natural planet a planet that's trapped in time, maybe by Saturn, maybe by Kronos, and we're trapped in, the, in here with this distortion. I think that rather than worrying about them taking our guns or worrying about what's going to happen when they march us off or FEMA camps and all that stuff, I think we should worry about being human. And I think we should try to be human all the time, every day, all day. We have to be the caring, wonderful, creative, imaginative group that we are all the time, all day, every day. Because I'll tell you what, we're having a, we're having a holographic experience. We're an avatar in a holographic experience. And we're learning things, and we're practicing things, and we're learning how to be a more evolved, more conscious being, so that uh, perhaps when we evolve beyond this little trip in this uh, deeply uh, materialistic uh, materium here, then we can go out and spread our, our, our goodness uh, throughout the universe. Maybe, maybe that's what we're about. Maybe we're not about cowering in fear. Maybe we're not about worrying about uh, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and whether they're going to mind control us, take our weapons. Maybe we're not about that. Maybe we're about getting ourselves back into whack. Maybe we're getting ourselves back into love, back into the... Hey, look, human beings are as natural as a beautiful tree out there. We're, we're that same vibration. We're a natural loving vibration when we're loving, uh, not when we're in fear. So I think we should uh, face Jade Helm by wanting to know about it, wanting to help one another, wanting to be in love with one another, wanting to, wanting to learn from this avatar experience. Hey, if we're a hologram, when we die, we just, all we lose is our perspective. And we go back probably to uh, a more vast, a more all-encompassing perspective of what's going on. All we lose is this little ego perspective. So that's nothing to be feared. It's really important that we stand up to Jade Helm and we realize that we're going to do the right thing in terms of morality. We're going to uh, act on behalf of our fellow humans. And I don't mean the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and the army that's coming to, uh, to take, rip our neighbors out of, the, uh, out of their home at night. 
We're not going to, we're going to act on behalf of, of natural law and get back into the natural, uh, we're going to, you see, what we're doing here is we're practicing. We're being faced with something that seems really horrifying. And even when you look at the aliens and the wars and things that might be going on, it's a scary place. And if we can do what um, uh, Miss Courier said, um, just not be in fear and just allow it to happen, allow ourselves to learn and do the right thing, we'll be, we'll be much better off. Uh, I think we have to realize that we're consciousness. And I know a lot about evolving consciousness and how it looks after it's, when it's, sta uh, when it's starting to see itself as being larger and larger. See, stilted consciousness is stuck in the ego. We're, we're stuck in, I want this, I want that, I want your half, I want, I want this, I'm in the Dulcie base and I'm, and I'm working, you know, it's not about that. It's about as you get larger and larger and you see yourself as more than your little ego, when you see yourself as a group of humans, more than a race, I think race is the biggest bullshit that, well, like it, it competes with religion. Uh, the biggest way to separate people and get them to stop loving one another. Um, we have to we have to get over that. We have to see one another, human beings, as as ourselves. And when the the Israelis uh, trap people in Palestine and torture and kill them, we have to see that as us. We have to do something about it. We have to help them. We have to help them get out of that fear so they can evolve too. Now, let me tell you another thing that's going on. If we think that we're the most evolved uh, humans uh, in the universe or evolved species of evolving consciousness of the universe, I think we're really wrong. I think we're, uh, we're in third grade and there might be other beings, other humans that are in fifth, sixth, seventh, all levels of consciousness. Now, if their expanded consciousness they see us as them. They see our pain as their pain. They, and when you get to that, that expanded level of consciousness, you can't sit around and watch TV or watch sports or, or, or play with your toys. You have to do something because you're, you're being hurt. Your, your fellow humans are being hurt. You have to do something. That's why there's a lot of people on the planet that are taking a lot of big risks to try to communicate, to get people to come together, to see what's going on so that this whole thing can be, can be stopped, so that, so that this distortion can stop and we can continue evolving consciousness. Now, if there are beings that are in 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade and we're in 3rd, their mission their mission would be to help us. So I am sure that whatever is going on out in space or perhaps whatever is going on underground, because we've encountered uh, civilizations underground ourselves, uh, naming, namely the Erks civilization in Argentina, that are highly evolved consciousness. And they're working to see us work through this temporary lock with fear and, and in the materium. Uh, and I'm sure there are other beings outside uh, to do that also. So I guess the bottom line to Jade Helm is we don't know what they're doing. They've kept us out of the loop. We know that they've got a ton of different ways to entrap us. They, we know that they're swapping souls. They're doing the worst things that we could think of. And uh, some of them are reptilians. And some of these reptilians, scary, scary dudes. But that pulls us back into the materium.
That pulls us back into low consciousness. That pulls us back into, oh my God, my little ego, I've got to watch, make sure that my body isn't destroyed or hurt and that they don't take away my toys. We've got to get over that. Uh, it's time for human beings to evolve to the next step. And I suggest that all this scary stuff that's happening, that all this Jade, jade Helm bullshit that's happening is for us to, to stop and get back into what we are. Get back into natural consciousness. Get back into love. There, there, love will always overpower fear. Uh, there's, a, there's a little story I'm going to tell you. We worked on a case, and we publicized a lot of it, uh, about uh, Hempstead, England. There was, a, there was a satanic cult who was torturing, still is, right now torturing children, and uh, they threatened them with, with horrible things. They threatened these children that they torture, and, and they, they have sex with these children. They torture them, they eat babies, body parts, they drink blood. These, these are horrible demons. Uh, I think there could be some humans that were corrupted into that, but certainly all the bloodlines do that. Well, I'll tell you what, there was one man, and his name was Abraham. And he got to know kids that were going through this. Now, you never hear kids break the ranks and, and tell about this stuff because it's terrifying for them. Uh, they're, they're terrified because they're tortured now. What's going to happen if they tell and they're threatened? But this man loved them so much that they told him everything. Uh, he assured them that he could do something. He didn't know how powerless he would be. But his love broke them loose. And that's what I think we all need to do. We need to not look at Jade Helm as the biggest fear evoking uh, thing that's happening in our lives. We should say, well, this is the biggest fear invoking thing that could be happening in our lives. I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm going to go in. I'm going to make sure my neighbors have enough to eat. I'm sure I'm going to make sure that what well, the other day I was coming up with a plan for a hundred lovers and I was wondering what would happen if a hundred people, different races, different creeds, different religions, would be decide to be in love. And with that little small group of people, we would make sure that the children were educated in properly, not educated like they're doing in the United States and throughout Europe, educated properly in moral law, in, in how to learn, in how to think, in how to reason. When this, for this group of 100, we would make sure that we all had a place to live, that we all had enough to eat. And, and when the 101st person came along to join, we would tell them, find 100 more lovers. Because you know when it gets big, it gets corrupted. But if we can stay little, and then those hundred lovers can spawn a hundred more lovers. There's nothing that can stop that. So, anyway, I wanted to talk about Jade Helm. And I wanted to talk about what we don't know. Why are they doing this? What about the hollow bullets? What about the uh, Tupperware coffins? Uh, and what about, how does this work with the Dulce base and all the, all the deep underground bases that are all around the world? And those entities that are, that are working down there and driving down there. Believe me, when we ascend, when we awaken, we're going to be taking a lot of the positive entities with us. I think some of the reptilians, quite frankly. And I know that there are entities outside that are higher evolved than us that have one thing on their mind. And that one thing is to help us. So we have to help ourselves. So that's the wildest Jade Helm idea I'm, think, I'm sure you've ever heard. But I, I, I'm glad that you stuck with us through this whole thing. 
and you weren't too terrified. And uh, that's my two cents worth for this week. It's been great being with you on the World Beyond Belief. Take care. Love one another.